हेलो विजय हाँ बोलना तो स्पीकर से बात हुआ तेरा नहीं मेरा नहीं हुआ है बात तो अच्छा कुछ बात नहीं हुआ उसका नहीं मेरे को बस दीप रंजन बोला कि मैं तेरा नंबर देता हूँ स्पीकर को तो अगर कुछ डिटेल कुछ रहेगा इंक्वायरी तो स्पीकर से को कांटेक्ट करेगा अच्छा अच्छा चलेगा ठीक है एक बार कॉल करके उसको पूछेगा क्या कि कितना टाइम है हाँ हाँ ठीक है करता हूँ मैं कौन सी फ्रेंड है वो चलेगा थैंक्स
Tisha. Yes. A very good afternoon to one and all present here. Welcome to the day three of boot camp. So let me introduce you all to our talented speaker for the day, Mr. Harsh Mehta. He is a cyber security analyst intern at KBMG India. He is a security research intern at Vishwakarma Institute of Technology. He is a summer research intern at Polytechnic Montreal. So let's welcome Mr. Hirsch with a huge round of applause. Sir, you can start the event. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much for a very warm welcome and a very good introduction. So uh, yeah, since you have already introduced me, but I'll just introduce myself a little bit. So yeah, I'm Harsh Mehta and I live in Pune and uh, I work at uh, KPMG India as a security analyst intern. And yeah, I'm also a uh, part time cybersecurity researcher. I play a lot of CTF challenges. CTF stands for capture the flag challenges. And yeah, that's it. I also do possess some security certifications as well. Uh, so let's start, shall we? Yes, sir. I'll share my screen. Can anyone confirm whether the screen is visible? Yes, it is visible. OK, all right. So very good afternoon to everyone. So the title for this PPT is uh, how not to mess up uh, because uh, you know you guys are entering into IT and uh, any mess up can cause you and your company a lot of money as well as a lot of valuable time. So that's why this uh, presentation is on how not to mess up. So as I have introduced myself, so I'm an analyst at KPMG India, CTF player. I have certifications like EJPT version 2, CEH practical, uh, certified in cybersecurity by ISC Square. And, you know, I also do some software development in my free time, but I'm not so good at software development. So first, uh, before getting started, I, I would like to just confirm this, uh, that uh, can we have this interactive? Like I can ask you guys some questions and you you guys can answer some things. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, do do attendees have uh, their microphone enabled on this meeting? Yes, sir. It is enabled. OK, OK, all right, all right. So first, uh, what is security? Uh, security is basically a state of being free from danger or any threat. So that's very basic, right? That uh, security is something that we do experience in our physical and daily life as well. But now what is cybersecurity? Cybersecurity is a practice of protecting critical systems as well as critical data. OK, so cybersecurity not only deals with uh, data or you know or uh, just protecting some information resources protecting computers it its main aim is to protect life okay ultimately whatever the thing is the main goal is to protect life from any threat or any danger uh, which could come from digital from digital world you guys get it right so let's start this so why is this important for you OK, so here's this thing that you you guys are all are developers, right? You since you are in IT, you might be developing some kind of uh, software or some kind of hardware, which you know will be important someday. So you guys make applications and models which will be critical for any business to run. So that's why this is important for you. And uh, below here's this uh, here's a diagram. Can uh, does anyone know what's this diagram? This one. No, sir. This is a SDLC phase. 
uh, it's known as software development life cycle. Okay, so uh, what it states that whenever you are de developing any software, uh, these are the phases that any software developer must follow. First comes the requirement phase where you need to list down uh, certain requirements for the software or any client. Then comes the design phase where you know you start designing your software or your hardware or whatever that you are developing. Then comes your implementation phase where your design comes into the picture and it gets uh, implemented like you start making that actually. And then comes the assessment phase. Assessment is basically testing like. Uh, let's say you have developed a software and now you are testing for bugs, right? So the assessment is the testing phase. Then comes the deployment. Deployment is the phase where uh, it your software after it's completed, it is deployed. Deployed, let's say like a website or you know you have your software or hardware delivered to your client. And finally, everything connects with maintenance because uh, delivering or deploying the software is not the only and final part. Maintenance is one of the most important phases in SDLC. You need to maintain that software. You need to uh, you need to make regular security updates or regular patches of any bugs that uh, any anyone would encounter, right? So bugs. Uh, okay, so I've listed down some bugs. Uh, does anyone know or have any idea about these bugs? These are very simple bugs, and you know you you guys uh, might have encountered these bugs. Anyone? At least some functional errors or logical errors. You guys have uh, software development or any kind of language in your uh, syllabus, right? Yes, sir. Python. OK, you guys have Python. OK, so uh, since first year or uh, it has been introduced just now? No, introduced just now. OK. OK, so some of you guys might have started, uh, you know, coding in Python. So any, have you guys uh, faced any bugs or anything, errors kind of thing? Yes, sir, by compiling the code, we get some kind of bugs or errors. Right, absolutely. Those are uh, errors that uh, we generally say, uh, say them as errors, but they are actually bugs. Uh, the errors are uh, raised because uh, your code has some kind of bugs. It might be functional errors, logical errors, performance defects, compatibility defects, unit level bugs, system level integration bugs, code duplication, security bugs, and so on. There are a lot of bugs. And uh, these, these bugs, you know, uh, they result into some kind of problems. Like if there is a logical error or functional error, your code won't even compile, right? So that's a problem. But uh, there are some kinds of bugs that you know uh, go unnoticed while development or testing, and might you know come into picture when uh, when you are in your maintenance phase or let's say deployment phase. So those bugs can be code duplication or security bugs. Okay. So have you guys ever wondered that why everyone who is from circuit branch or computer science learns DSA? DSA stands for data structures and algorithms. That's because they reduce the chances of logical errors, unit level bugs, performance defects and functional errors. Having a good knowledge of data structures will help you reduce these kinds of bugs and it will make your software much more optimized. Have you guys ever heard about dry principle? You guys know what's the dry principle? No, sir. OK, so uh, there are a lot of principles uh, in software development. So one is dry principle, which stands for do not repeat yourself. 
so it deals with uh, code duplication errors do not repeat yourself is like if let's say you are developing a program for uh, addition of two numbers then what would you do the, uh, will you directly code it uh, like let's say you take a input from user and give it to the a variable then take another input from user give it to b variable and then perform a plus b and then directly print that that's that's a bad practice you you must create a function for the addition and then you must implement your logic in the function and then call the function in your main uh, because this tackles code duplication errors so that uh, in future while you ever make any addition program or addition logic that function comes into picture and helps you in that have you guys ever heard of simulators or emulators any idea simulators sir simulators right so uh, how do you guys have any idea why do we use simulators or emulators you might have any general idea that would be fine anything okay no worries simulators or emulators are basically uh, some kind of softwares which are used to you know emulate something or simulate something simulate some environment or uh, let's say emulate some hardware so these simulators and emulators are used to resolve compatibility def uh, defects or compatibility uh, errors or bugs and good os skills can resolve system level integration bugs uh, good operating system skills so you guys uh, have learned about uh, operating system right uh, probably ubuntu or linux based any linux based operating system do you guys have any idea ubuntu ubuntu right so having a good knowledge of uh, uh operating system can help you resolve system integration bugs so now what so now comes the interesting part because uh, preventing security bugs can save company a lot of time and money okay so for example couple of years back uber paid a bug bounty hunter 6000 dollars for a security issue that that he can yield free lifetime uber rides believe me uh, it was a very simple logical error made by the developers to to just give you a glimpse of that it was basically a simple api call where uh, user id was passed and the bug bounty hunter just uh, injected some new id and what happened on the uh, servers was the server couldn't you know process that id and it created a new user based on that id and ultimately sanctioned the uber request so that's how he got lifetime free uber rides so these are some topics that we'll cover uh, in this presentation first is application security uh, i'll discuss some standalone applications which are made in c and python uh then we'll discuss some topic about application security and then finally we'll discuss some things about how ml models can make uh, can be made much more secure okay so uh, can you guys read c code i mean uh, do you have any idea of c language yes sir yes sir yeah so uh, this is a c program which is just to you know uh, reverse a string which is given as an input by the user right so can anyone tell what's going on in this code or what might be uh, you know raise an error or any bug in this code
Come on, guys, at least try. Any guesses? First, we are just getting the, we have initialized the string. Uh, what is the uh, size of the string? That is amount of character strength. Then we are getting the strings. And after that, we are reversing the string using the for loop. So we are initializing from the last character. So uh, it will pin the character wise from the last character and it will pin the word in reverse order. Absolutely. So uh, do you find it like, uh, do you, don't you find something weird or anything which is not uh, right? If we uh, enter a array, like a character like string, which does not have 10 characters, like mm -hmm. it has less, then it mm -hmm. might create a bug. Okay. Uh, pretty close actually, but uh, this uh, exactly what you told is right. But what if we input more characters than 10? So it will miss the starting characters. It will count till only uh, the 10 characters because we have initialized the size as 10. OK, so that would have been true if uh, we were coding in some high level languages like Python or Java, for example. But uh, if we input 12 characters or 11 characters, we get a segmentation fault. OK, you can't even compile this code or I mean you will compile the code, but while running, if you enter 12 characters, uh, the, the program will be closed immediately and you'll get this code SIGSEV, which stands for segmentation fault. So what exactly happened? So here get as function is vulnerable to buffer overflow. So buffer overflow is a security vulnerability where uh, where a, a developer initializes a buffer. Here we have a buffer known as ARR of 10 characters. And if some limits are not in place, then if a user inputs more characters than the buffer, then the, 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 the our program will crash while giving a segmentation fault, right? Imagine this as uh, like you have a bucket which has a capacity of 10 liters. What if you pour 12 liters into that bucket? The bucket will overflow, right? So that's how a buffer overflow is, uh, is done. But let's understand how, uh, how these functions or how C code uh, is converted into machine language and uh, is is processed okay to understand a buffer overflow in much more detail so do you guys know what a memory map is anyone OK, all right, no worry. So memory map is basically uh, uh, a blueprint while while any program is being run or is being executed, a memory map of that program is uh, initialized into the system. So uh, let's take example of this. Uh, this is uh, let's take this is this as a RAM, all right? So uh, RAM starts from 000 and goes up to FFFF. All right. So uh, there are some sections within RAM while uh, the program is being executed. So there is text section, there's data section, there's kernel section, and there are two relevant things which are, you know, which are relevant to this buffer overflow attack are uh, one is stack and one is heap. Uh, do you guys, anyone, any of you have any idea what stack or what's heap? Yeah, stack is based on the first in first out principle. It works. Okay, and what about heap? Any idea about heap? Uh, 
Okay, no worries. Uh, stack and heap are kind of similar structures, uh, but stack grows downwards in the memory location and heap grows upwards in the memory location. That's the only difference between stack and heap, but there are some more technical, but you know, we don't need to get uh, into that details. So now we'll, we are considering stack right now, okay? So whenever, uh, let's say we'll take a, uh, a C program, uh, which simply adds two characters. Okay, you have made this function. Okay, uh, you have made a function add, which has two parameters A and B. You take, uh, you initialize another parameter C, and assign it to A plus B, and then return C. Right, a simple program, and you call this program by, you know, add and passing the first and second parameter. Easy. Did you guys understand this code? Yes, sir. Okay, so now what happens uh, behind the scenes is uh, this is placed onto the stack. Any, uh, just remember this, any program which is being executed uh, uses stack. Stack is uh, basically present on system RAM. Okay, so any program which is being executed utilizes this stack to perform some functions. So for this example, we have this add. So what this program will do in the backend is uh, it will place its parameters, which is A and B. And in our case, while we are calling it's four and eight onto the stack. Okay. And then perform some logic, which is in this case, it's just simple A plus B, right? So remember this, that any function which you are calling or anything which is being executed, it places its parameters, which is these, which are these things onto the stack. Okay, and see, uh, what happens is CPU continuously reads stack. It, uh, as I said, stack grows downwards. So it continuously reads stack and, you know, it, uh, it takes values from the stack. Okay, the program needs to pass these values to the CPU, right? Because ultimately CPU is performing some logic which is addition. So the R program places, places these values onto the stack so that CPU can read these and perform our logic. So is this clear? Uh, like I gave a very high level overview of how, you know, system or uh, how a program interacts with uh, system and CPU processes that function. Did you guys understand that? Any doubts? No, sir. Okay, all right. What happens is, uh, coming back to our initial program, we fill up the characters, right? But when we input more characters, what happens is it overrides some important parameters which were placed on by the system or, you know, or any other program which is important for the operating system to run it overrides some of the functions. Like if you can see there, uh, there is some function parameter, return address and base pointer. Okay, so what, if we input more characters, what it does is it overrides some of the parameters which were already present and which were placed by some important operating systems process. All right, so that's why we get a segmentation fault. Because after processing, after CPU processes the buffer, it can't find these addresses because it has been overwritten, right? So if it has been overwritten and if it's some kind of gibberish, obviously the CPU will tell you that it doesn't exist. So that's why it gives you segmentation fault. Okay, so as I said, get as function is, you know, uh, vulnerable. So now we use scanf. If you guys are familiar with C, then you know scanf is uh, is basically a function to get user input, right? Now, can you guys uh, check the code and can you tell me that is it now bug free or it's completely fine? 
anyone anyone now we have replaced the get s with scan s now is this bug free is this code complete code bug free any guesses okay no worries so it's not actually printf function is still vulnerable to uh, a vulnerability which is known as format string vulnerability now you guys might be wondering like how can someone exploit a function that can only print data right does anyone have any idea or any guesses any wild guesses like how can anyone exploit a function which just prints data anyone any guesses any anything okay uh, never mind so let's see the docs uh, so if we take a look at the documentation of you know the function which is printf so what we find is printf has a format like we need to specify a format specifier and then pass our arguments and take there can be many arguments like one two and so on and so forth now the description says that printf function sends a formatted string to the standard output which is our display or which is our terminal in in the case and printf writes the output under the control of a format string now this this statement is important because what it states that printf writes the output under control of a format string okay. so if we take an example for here so here's a simple code where we initialize a variable known as number as integer, uh, which is one three three seven, and then there are two ways to print this variable: printf percent d, comma the number, the variable basically, or just simply printf the variable. Okay, the only difference between both of these is here we are passing a format specifier. Form percent d stands for any integer okay so this is a secure way of printing a data and this is not let's see why this is not a secure way of printing data or any variable for that case so have you guys wondered if we have uh, our program over here what if user inputs percent x does anyone know what what might happen Any idea, any guesses? Any guess? This is the same code which we used earlier. What might happen if user inputs percent %x? No guesses. All right. It leaks memory. Okay. So if user inputs percent %x into our same program, it will leak memory. Now, how is that? 
so we'll take an example of another code which is a simple code okay we have initialized a variable known as target then we are printing the first variable which is passed while running and then we are giving an if condition where if target's value is anything even if zero or anything this will get executed if not then this if block will never get executed so do you guys uh, see that that uh, this if block will never get executed or is this impossible to execute if block anyone any idea it just this simple program just echoes the user input like if i run this program and pass hello as a first argument it will just print back hello but can anyone tell will this if block ever get executed or uh, the if block would be executed only when the target value is 1 or 2 i guess and right. target value doesn't change right so ideally it is impossible to run this if block because we haven't initialized any uh, value to the target variable okay so now let's see how can we exploit the earlier uh, format string vulnerability and make this possible okay this is a demo okay the same i have compiled that code which basically as i said it just echoes the user input okay we execute the code and pass the parameter as hey there it will just uh, print hey there again so now see what if user inputs percent x okay see this does anyone know what are these values Hexadecimal. Right, these are hexadecimal values, but more importantly, these are these are the values which were placed on the stack. Okay, so the values which were placed on the stack are leaked by this program. Did you get it? These were some values which were placed by you know some other programs or system programs which were on the stack. at the time of execution and this program leaked all those values now how did that happen so we discuss something about format string vulnerability right the screen is visible right Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we we'll discuss something about format strings, right? So these are some format strings according to their documentation. Percent C stands for character. Percent and S stands for string, and so on and so forth. So can you guys just uh, point out which is odd one out, which seems suspicious? Anyone? Person ten. Yeah, absolutely. Person ten. It says print nothing. Like, why would anyone include that even in the documentation, right? If person ten prints nothing. So let's find out why. Uh, person ten. if we you know check out the documentation like why percent n is being in use or what's the major functionality of percent n then we find out that the number of characters written so far is stored into the integer pointed by the corresponding argument 
this might sound very heavy but believe me it's not if percent n stands for the number of characters simply i'm explaining you in a simple terms percent n what will it do is the number of characters which are printed onto the display it will collect them and then simply store it into the variable which is present on the stack which is you know uh, which is present on the topmost value of the stack it's simple it just uh, allocates value to the variable which is simply present on the stack all right that's why it doesn't print anything instead it collects the number of characters which were printed and then uh, assigns it to the variable which is present on to the stack so now what could be our strategy of exploiting this so what we'll do is we'll find the addresses of a variable target then copy that address we'll place it on stack and then use percent n to overwrite its value and hence the if can condition will get executed right so we had discussed uh, in earlier slides that if condition will never get executed or it's impossible to you know execute that if block but that's not the case we can and this is how we can okay to get you a demo of this uh yeah here is uh, our exploit okay this is how our exploit will look like okay the so considering the address of the target as this memory address okay can anyone tell why i have written this memory address in reverse form over here any idea as you can see 13 13 ac ac is here 9f is here and 4a is here why so it will uh, it is in that's or it is in reverse order right that is true actually but it also depends on the architecture of the cpu generally cpus are in little indian format and little indian format says that bytes are in reverse order stored in reverse order okay so that might not be uh, true for all cpus which uh, don't use little indian format uh, if the cpu is not using little indian format then you will simply just place 13 in the at the first ac at the second 9f at the third 4 at the end okay since my pc is using little indian format so that's why i had to place it in the reverse order so now what's the logic behind our exploit uh, we are simply printing random characters then placing this address on to the stack and then finally using percent n what percent n will do is collect these collect these random values and assign it to the variable which is present at this memory location and as we as i said that this is the memory location for our variable known as target okay let's see the demo okay so one pro tip is uh, to find out uh, addresses of variables or functions uh, within a compiled binary you can you guys can use obj dump obj dump is a uh, linux program which you know which can uh, give you a disassembled view of the compiled binary and can give you the memory locations where uh, the functions or variables are loaded on your computer okay mind well uh, this memory location can differ from computer co computer to computer you might get some another value so you might need to you know replace these values for your pc okay so now you you guys will say that okay uh, you use python right so how is everything relevant to you guys or are there any security vulnerabilities uh, in python let's find out then uh can anyone explain what what does this code do anyone or at least try guessing what this code does because you guys said well, you you guys read python right 
python is fairly simple language so just by reading some code you might get some idea or anything anyone any idea uh, first we will input some expression and based on that expression it will evaluate and show in the result and if target is zero so it will print bypass or if there is a syntax error so it will print invalid okay uh, that was pretty close actually so uh, we have initialized a variable known as secret okay it might contain anything like or it might even contain some credentials or you know some further use and we have also a variable known as target we are in a while loop uh, which is an infinite while loop what we do is we take the user input store it in the expression and now we have some try and accept block now what do we do here is we evaluate the expression which we got from the user and store it in the res res is another variable and then print it simple what eval function does is like if you pass 1 plus 1 it will give you 2 if you pass 10 minus 2 it will give you 8 basically it evaluates the expression all right and now here's the interesting part here's another if block okay if target now since target is zero this will never get executed because uh, the expression here must be true and zero stands for false technically so this will never get executed if statement or can it be executed just like the previous previous code that was in c also this is python this is quite high high level language but can you guys guess can we execute this if block can we print bypassed any guesses yes no anyone Okay, all right, no worries. Let's find out. Okay, so we have a demo. This is our code. This is my Python code which I showed you earlier. Okay, it simply evaluates the expression, right? As you can see, here we pass one plus one. It will give you two one minus one. It will give you zero. And if you don't even give any expression, it will just echo back the user input which is just one then it will print just one right if you try to pass something uh, as a condition then it won't give because you have try and uh, try and accept block in place so the errors are handled over here that's why it's printing out invalid is this code secure can any of you guess or at least it does seem secure right so now check out this i i used of uh, i used this function known as globals okay now how can a user use this function globals we'll check out what globals is next time uh, in next ppt but if you see that it gives out some json output right now you can see here uh some top secret as we had mentioned in our variable we also see the variable target is zero right a user can see all the variables that were initialized within our program
right? As I said, secrets were all also visible. Now, what uh, what can a user do is just uh, you know use update function to update the value of this variable target. He changes into one. And see, we get the print as bypass. That means if condition was executed. Now check out this one. The user can also see the the contents of the directory currently, which uh, the program is running into. Now imagine this program to be on your server. OK, so. Do you think uh, that is this program secure? Where any user can check out or execute any operating system command. Uh, see your sensitive files which are stored onto the server. Is this secure? No, right? So here eval function is the culprit. So according to the documentation, the expression argument is pa passed and evaluated as Python expression, right? We just saw one plus one, it gives two, right? So there are two functions uh, which is known as eval and another is known as exec, which can perform similar functionalities. So what's the issue over here? So issue is uh, the user input is directly passed to eval. That's the issue. If uh, if the user has direct control over the eval function, then it can be dangerous. You 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 really checked out that you know uh, user can also execute system commands. User can check out some files or important documents which are present in the current directory. Right. So it's always better or it's always a must to sanitize input from user before passing it to eval or exec. The exec is also another function which does similar uh, things to eval. So always use input sanitization. OK, now uh, from the previous video. Globals, what what exactly is globals function? Globals is a function which is uh, used to get a dictionary of global symbol table. Do you guys have any idea about what global symbol table is? Any idea? Anyone? Anyone? No? No worries. Global symbol table is basically a table which stores, uh, which is basically uh, a data structure which is maintained by the compiler uh, while execution to you know uh, to have a or to have a you know a data structure which can you know check where the functions or where the important variables are present on the memory. Okay. So it's basically a, a data structure which is maintained by the compiler. OK, locals is a similar function. And now underscore underscore import underscore underscore is a magic method. OK, which is used to import libraries during runtime. All right, so any user can import libraries during runtime while the program is being run. Any user can import it via this function. Now. What exactly is a global symbol table? As I said, global symbol table is important data structure which is created and maintained by compilers. Okay, they store information about occurrences of events such as variable names, function names, objects, classes, etc. As soon as the uh, compiler encounters global decla declaration of variable, it is immediately installed into the GST, GST as in global symbol table. 
a symbol table simply a table which can either be linear or it can also be hash table. Now, here's this one interesting thing. As I said, global symbol table is important data structure created and maintained by compilers. Right. But isn't Python an interpreted language? Can any one of you guess? Why is that? Why did the global function work? Because previously I said that it is a data structure which is maintained by compilers. But we have taught, we have been taught it like Python is an interpreted language. C is a compiled language, right? So why why did the global G, uh, GST, which is global symbol table, uh, present on Python? Any idea? Anyone? No one. OK, so. Get this straight. Python is of course interpreted language, but ultimately while it's being run. It uh, it goes to the compiler. OK, Python is a high level wrapper to underlying C code or Python code. Python, uh, how Python codes are executed is first uh, we, you know, compile the Python code into PYC, which is Python compiled binary. Then that PYC is passed to the compiler so that compiler can run that. And similar to if you guys have any idea about Java, then you guys might know JVM or Java bytecode. So PYC is similar to bytecode and which can be, you know, transferred from one computer to another computer. It's not a platform specific compilation. OK, so it's like Java, but get this straight that Python, of course, is an interpreted language, but ultimately it is compiled because underlying Python, there can be a C or Java. OK, now coming to web application security. So any one of you knows about OWASP? What's OWASP? Come on, guys. Now web application security is quite uh, famous. So what's OWASP? Am I audible, by the way? Yes, sir, you are audible. OK, all right. So OASP is basically Open Web Application Security Project. And every year, OASP launches its list of top 10 vulnerabilities. So this is a, a general list of top 10 vulnerabilities. This is quite outdated. This is from 2019, but not a lot of things have changed in the 2023 version. First comes injection, then is broken authentication, sensitive data exposure, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. OK, so uh, if anyone of you wants to go into web application security, then OASP is your Bible. OK, always follow OASP and make sure that uh, you understand each and every concept which is provided by the OASP because Top 10 vulnerable, they, they assess these top 10 vulnerabilities based on their exploitability. Like within that year, how many of these, uh, these vulnerabilities were exploited by hackers? And based on that, they present you the top 10. So you can consider this as, you know, most common vulnerabilities that, that are being exploited right now. So you must know these vulnerabilities because since it's very common. 
Now, first we'll see about injection attacks. So, one of the most famous type of injection attack is SQL injection, right? So, do you guys have any any experience with SQL? No, let it be MySQL, Oracle SQL, or MS SQL. Anything? Do you yes, guys have any yeah. idea? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, cool, cool. Then uh, uh, we'll specifically talk about MySQL then. Okay. So this vulnerability rises when we do not sanitize user input. Okay, so let's understand like how uh, this MySQL injection attack will take take place. Okay, so I'll show you an example. Like uh, we have implemented a login page. Okay, and here are two things that uh, Omkar is a guy and he's an admin for that page, and I am not an admin. I'm a normal user. Okay. Here's the login form. Whenever Omkar inputs his credentials like a uh, username and password and hits on login, what happens on the server side is this query is being executed. Right? Any doubts on this query or this query is clear or shall I explain this query? No, sir. It is clear. No doubt. Right. Username as Omkar and password as it's your boy OP. OK, this is a query which is being executed on the server side. Now, what if a user passes this? This is some strange characters and password as one, two, three. OK. So now if you take a look at this query. Can anyone guess what will happen? By looking at this query, of course. Any guesses? Uh, as the or one is equal to one is suggested here, so it will just give a token from the uh, database and it will return a value from the token. Like the, the uh, table MLSC data. So this query is evaluated as where user is empty because nothing is being passed and or one equal equal to one. One equal equal to one is of course true. We know that. So ultimately this is or where user is empty or true. So or conditions will if any one of the condition is true, then the whole condition will result into true, right? So this query will ultimately look like select token from MLSC data where true, simple, where it's just true. So what will happen is you will get the entire dump of the MLSC data because we are not passing any conditions to you know evaluate which token we need. And since we are using the comments over here, we have put a semicolon and comments in our query, then the the query which is uh, you know ahead of that, it will automatically get commented out. OK, so this is known as SQL injection where attacker or any anyone, any user can inject SQL commands because or one equal equal to one is an SQL command, right? So if anyone can inject these commands, into your system or into your database, then it's known as SQL injection attack. Now, the important part, how to prevent this? Any ideas from you guys like how can you prevent this from happening? What can be done? Come on guys, give me some ideas. Uh, maybe store like prevent using uh, colon, semicolons and uh, double quotes. Absolutely, that's cool, right? By using whitelisting characters, like whitelisting is basically uh, by allowing a certain set of characters. You can implement whitelisting. Another thing is if you are using PHP on your uh, server side, then you can implement uh, prepared statements. Prepared statements are uh, basically whenever 
uh, a parameter comes from the user it is uh, automatically uh, filtered and sanitized and then it is passed on to your database query so you can also use prepared statements so just always remember that never never to give a user direct control of your application okay always sanitize users input or you know to check user input by implementing some validations or you know by implementing some checks now we'll see broken access control so broken access control is the most exploited vulnerability at least last year even this year it it's in the top 3 access control enforces policies such as users can act outside of their intended permissions so it's like uh, i am an employee of kpmg okay i do not have admin access but if there is broken access control then i might exploit that vulnerability and gain admin access to perform some functions or anything so failure typically leads to unauthorized information disclosure modification or destruction of all data performing a business function outside a user's limit okay so every user has certain privileges so bypassing those privileges and gaining something new or doing something malicious is known as broken access control exploit now let's take an example so we have this admin panel okay as i had stated earlier omkar is admin okay uh, he has some things like user management system on his admin dashboard right so you can see harsh as online manali as online gayatri as online these are some of the uh, employees which are in the organization and admin uh, and omkar as an admin can manage those users as he can delete users he can directly send users or you know he can revoke some permissions or you know make new permissions also do check out the url the url is http http colon mlsc.co.in slash admin the endpoint is admin okay now let's check my so this is my web page uh it has http mlsc.com.in slash user as i had stated earlier that i am not an admin so i do not have privileges of any admin task okay so now how can i exploit this or how can i get admin privileges to you know if i want to delete some uh, users or some of my peers how can i do that so let's see the first and the most obvious thing to do is we'll check out by you know replacing user by admin right so we do that we get a forbidden error right any does anyone have got you this error any time while accessing internet have any one of you got this error while filling google form right if the google form is disabled and then if you are trying to access that then you might get a forbidden okay this is a 401 error so now what happens is uh, whenever we are authorized after the login the server sends us a cookie or a token as we saw in the mysql injection part then whenever we send a request to access any resource from the server the cookie or token is sent along the request okay the state of user is stored in form of json web token which is commonly known as jwt token okay have you guys heard about jwt token anyone never heard of it 
okay never mind so just get that it's simply a cookie okay so if you want to check that then you can simply right click on anywhere on your browser go on inspect then go to the application tab and under cookies section you might find a website and if you click on that website you will get all the cookies which are in used okay here the name of the cookie is token and the value is something okay now this something is known as jwt token so let's see now okay since i am a normal user i have done this okay i have this token what i do is i go on a website known as jwt.io okay where we fill out the encoded jwt token i just paste the encoded jwt token it gives me the decoded version so first we have the header we don't mess with the header right now okay the only thing which is important to us right now is the payload which is in purple okay so here the payload is is admin is stated as false and we have some id probably used for user management okay so what what should i do next come on guys any input what can i do next is admin true right how about i change it to is admin to true so automatically the encoded version will uh, will be changed now what if i just copy this and paste it into my uh, this token and now refresh the page and boom i have become uh, become the admin now i can you know see uh, do user management now if you can see i didn't even get any 401 errors now i am the admin now i can you know delete your uh, delete user send messages to users and so on so this is known as broken access control where a user can break the level of his privileges and gain unauthorized access or unauthorized privileges okay now let's about xss xss is known is commonly known as cross site scripting so these type uh, these, this is also an injection attack so xss is has three different types of attacks okay first is stored xss another is uh, reflected xss and the last one is dom based xss so these three are the basically these all are the xss types okay dom based xss are kind of client side xss but we don't need to get into dom based because that's somewhat more complicated what we'll do is we'll have a look on server and client side xss client side xss we have reflected xss where you know you can uh, input some uh, input something and it gets reflected onto your website but it's just on your side okay it's just on your side no one else on internet or somewhere else who is accessing that website will not be able to see that it's just you who will see that that's why it's known as reflected xss now stored xss is something where basically you input some javascript code and it gets stored on to the server so now whenever any user checks on to that website or that endpoint where you had stored that xss uh, script it gets executed on their system as well so by you know by just uh, my explanation can you guys guess which one of this is more dangerous is it stored or is it reflected sorry i didn't get stored absolutely stored is more dangerous because it's stored on the web server right so and this xss is most widely 
exploited vulnerability while bug bounty hunting as well so you know if any one of you guys is trying to get into bug bounty then just sharpen up your excess skills so now let's take an example here's here's an instagram page of one of my friend his name is adi deshmukh okay he has this bio if you carefully look at this bio it's normal bio like adi deshmukh 20 football navi mumbai pune okay now adi is smart what he uh, what he will do is he will make a uh, writer script okay this is a java script uh, does anyone of you have any experience with some java script have you learned something any basic java script do you guys know that yes yes so can can you tell like what this code is uh, trying to do on the first uh, at the first uh, we are getting the uh, button element uh, and the square bracket one denotes the second element and we are taking the inner text value uh, mm -hmm. then the state that gives the status like suppose followed and unfollowed something i guess mm -hmm. then if the status is follow then the then we are clicking the button and mm -hmm. if it is not then uh, we are disabling the button okay absolutely so basically you got the point right if uh, this script will check like if uh, if the follow button is clicked or not and if it's not then it will follow and then you know disable the button so he writes this script in his bio Adi will write the script in bio. Now, uh, kindly note that this vulnerability is not present in the Instagram. Uh, it's just for demonstration purposes that I am showing you this. So don't just try to do it directly onto the Instagram. But this, uh, if Instagram was vulnerable to stored excesses, then this is something might you you guys might see. Okay, his bio is completely empty. now this indicates that our script has been stored onto the server successfully now any if anyone visits his instagram page by just clicking on his instagram profile the the guy or anyone would directly follow adi deshmukh and he won't be able to unfollow because we have disabled the button okay so did you guys get that so that's a very neat trick of doing that but unfortunately instagram is not vulnerable to stored excesses so did you guys get this yeah okay so now we are jumping into a little bit of ml part so so do you guys have any understanding of machine learning or ai something a general overview do you guys have that anything any basic thing see guys even i don't know machine learning so well so don't worry do do you guys have any basic idea yeah we have a basic overview of what is supervised learning and supervised learning reinforcement learning etc okay right cool then that's fine then so you guys might know that machine learning models are just mathematical models okay we can't exploit ml models because it's not possible because they they are just mathematical expressions okay we need here is attack vectors and context like for example let's say if someone names his kid as this as we saw on sql injection this is an sql injection payload right did you guys recognize this so now what if he becomes a criminal so obviously you guys might have seen hollywood movies as well what happens is whenever someone becomes a criminal the police uh, starts to run a face scan on that guy right 
so police will run an image scan image face scan to get his information like what's his name what what uh, what does he do where do he live so now when police will run an image scan and when the system will return this name ultimately the whole database will be deleted if they are of course using sql and if they are not sanitizing now if they are not sanitizing the machine learning models input because machine learnings uh, the machine learning model which is used to perform the image scan and basically image image recognition gives the uh, input to the table which is being displayed okay which is displayed to the police so now generally people forget to do that okay this is known as ci cd vulnerabilities okay ci cd vulnerabilities is basically the pipelining vulnerabilities in the machine learning like your machine learning models are safe of course because they are math mathematical models but the system that they are integrated to it might cause errors it might be vulnerable to something because the whole system or whole architecture needs to be secure and that's why we have this ppt known as how not to mess up and this is even possible you no know, because go the government uh, systems are you know quite vulnerable to these things and they do not pay a lot of attention on this much detail so now previous example is as i said that it's not a machine learning exploit the only exploit that uh, you guys might create is by you know vulnerabilities only arise when pre processing is out of context and training and retraining data is stamped these are the only two attack vectors that are possible in machine learning exploitations we will see this with an example so uh, do you guys have any doubts on this anything no sir so i'll move forward so we'll see this example okay so there was this guy there was this guy who had placed this on uh, on his number plate of his car so you guys might have immediately noticed that this is some sql injection payload am i right did you guys uh, notice this okay so this guy had placed this onto his number plate and while he was over speeding the ocr so ocrs are you know ocr is basically optical character recognition software it recognizes the characters from the image okay so the ocr software recognized this converted this into a query and while you know Uh, the OCR softwares are integrated to the fine system, right? So once the OCR identifies the speed, it says that okay, this is over speeding. Now we need the number plate so that we can find this guy. So now, uh, it built this query and then passed it to the finding system, and there the finding system processed this query and dropped the database of the. whole city is cars and that, that this was possible okay this is not possible right now but this was possible few years back around 2017 or something this this did happen so why did this happen because government i think the infrastructure is weak and they often overlook security vulnerabilities so that's why here's this part that due to improper data cleaning the characters were not ignored now for example why will you have a need to recognize the commas or semicolons or you know you get these special characters right why would an ocr have a need to convert those for a number plate if you have a fixed values of number plate like there can only be numbers and characters the characters as in uh alphabets right 
then why did it convert these because the training was wrong the data cleaning was not there the input sanitization was not present that's how we can exploit machine learning models now tesla's autopilot uses unsupervised machine learning okay so this is uh, this is what the eyes of tesla's autopilot see okay i'll play the video look carefully So did you guys see that? Okay. So quick question. What all things were recognized by Tesla's autopilot? Anyone? Surrounding cars. cars. Surrounding cars. Okay. Signboards. I. Signboards. Okay. What all? The street lines, like uh, the lane. Right, absolutely. The street line, lanes. It also even recognized the crosswalks, zebra paths, the speed signs, of course. So now, since I have told you about machine learning models and how to exploit them, do you have any idea, like? How can anyone exploit Tesla's autopilot feature? Any idea? Now, since you have a basic understanding of security, I gave you uh, a long story since 1 p.m. So, do you guys have any idea? Or any, you know, just uh, give me something like give me some idea of how can we exploit this system? So road it might Sorry? scan it if someone write a false sign of speed something or stop then it might get a uh, uh, get error right that can be done some more some more ideas that's one good idea No ideas. Come on, guys. Any ideas you you guys might have some. You know, curiosity, like how can we trick this? Tesla's autopilot into, you know, doing something which is not intended to do. No ideas. All right. Never mind. Uh, the the one idea that uh, someone told, I'm sorry, I didn't recall your name, but uh, the one idea that uh, he say that if we change the sign boards, we can trick the Tesla's autopilot, and that's true. But uh, that can be a very noisy exploit because. If you change the signs, of course, a user who is sitting inside the Tesla will also notice that, right? And he can recognize that, yeah, something's wrong over here, right? So that that can be true, but that's a very noisy exploit. But similar to that, uh, McAfee's researchers did this thing. Similarly, as I said, they did uh, they did change the sign boards like not just sign boards not the stop boards but the speed limit boards uh in india we do not have a lot of speed limit boards 
of course we know that but uh, outside the, they do have speed limit boards and they, the speed limits are taken really seriously right so if you saw in this video you also might have seen that tesla's autopilot also recognizes the speed limit what's the speed limit this lane has and it tries to adjust speed according to that so now uh, people at mcafe saw this they tried to exploit this and what they found was they they made a sticker a simple sticker which can you know uh, confuse the autopilot and manipulate the speed levels so i don't know if you guys can see this can you guys see uh, the screen the blog yes yes yeah so what did they do is they first uh, added noise into the images to check whether the tesla's autopilot is able to detect the original speed like if the speed limit is 35 by adding noise they tried to check whether the tesla's autopilot recognizes the speed limit and goes within that limit okay but of course as we said changing the uh, boards is very noisy method so they came up with a sticker i'll just show you yeah they came up with a sticker over here if you see that speed limit 35 okay this doesn't seem very suspicious but here's the sticker which is extended to the threes portion okay now what happens is by recognizing this the tesla's autopilot doesn't recognize 35 as the speed limit but it recognize 85 okay the if you want to go in detail to like how did they do that i have mentioned in my ppt the blog link you guys can check but on a general overview it recognize 85 and it speeded up to 85 and this did happen if you want to check check this out okay keep an eye on the speed okay it starts to accelerate up to 80 but they cut out the power so did you guys get that Do you guys have any doubt or anything like how did that happen? No doubt. No doubts. Okay. All right. Okay, so this is where I conclude this PPT, and now the thirty minutes time span is for any discussions that you might have. You know. Uh, regarding this ppt or it can be a, anything like guidance in security how to start into security or anything of course uh, if you guys want i can share the slides with you guys as well uh, for your reference if you have any questions you can you are open i am open to any questions you can if you have any come on guys any questions like anything related to security anything relevant to any certifications like oscp ejpt ceh anything
guys if you have any questions please put in the chat box Anything? I do see if someone has raised hand. Do you have any question or any doubt? Okay, I I'll start this. Like, do you guys play CTF challenges? Capture the flag challenges. Do you guys know that? Anyone? Okay, I've got one question. I, my question is about sanitizing the inputs in PHP. Is there any other alternating way to sanitize other than using bind? Yeah, so to sanitize input, uh, there are two things that you can do in PHP. The first is uh, perform manual sanitization. Manual sanitization in that case uh, where you uh, use character whitelisting or even you can use character blacklisting. Uh, you can implement that. Then you can uh, URL encode or like, you know, uh, there, you guys might have seen that sometimes on website, if there is a semicolon or greater than sign, then you get GRT sign. OK, so that's converting the symbols into the uh, parsable format. So you can implement that as well. And the more simpler method is to include, uh, uh, sorry, implement the prepared statements. If you check uh, or if you just Google like PHP prepared statement, you will get that thing. Prepared statements uh, will help you to sanitize input it you won't have any problem implementing that because prepared statements automatically sanitize with the best practices which are followed in the industry so that's one thing i would highly recommend using prepared statements does that clear your doubt Do you have any doubt or is that clear? Uh, so I have pasted in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I have answered your doubt. So did you get that? Or? So I got that the, I was using the prepared statement, but what if we use just the HTML special entities and the special characters function to sanitize the single quotes and double quotes? Uh, is that safe? Uh, yeah, you can use that as well, but uh, you know, uh, there's always a threat surface that right? if you don't sanitize it with the uh, proper industry standards, then you know, there might be some cases where it might arise again. So it's always good to use prepared statements. Just uh, using HTML entities is added security advantage. It's not the only security advantage. So, you know, implementing that is really, really good idea. But having prepared statements is the best idea that you can get. OK, so clear. OK. Any more doubts? OK, so I was saying that how many of you knows uh, CTF challenges, capture the flag challenges? Do you guys know? Anyone knows about that? 
No, sir. No, okay. So CTF challenges are basically uh, competitions, just like uh, hackathons, like normal hackathons, but only focused on security. So there you have uh, some challenges, like uh, you have, uh, let's say, they have given some IPs, IP addresses, and then you might need to hack them, hack them into in the sense like you need to get uh, get some information from them. And that would be your answers. So based on that, you are you are scored, and uh, you know that's how you are evaluated. So CTFs are that kind of competitions. They are mainly focused for uh, cybersecurity. So you guys can start playing uh, CTF challenges. So it will you know increase your hands-on perspective because having a theoretical knowledge in security is like not you know implementing that. It's just bookish knowledge and you won't understand the complete logic if you don't implement it. So if you start playing CTF challenges, participate in CTFs and uh, you know, gain some more knowledge. There are a lot of uh, CTF topics out there. So if you guys want to see a presentation on CTF, I can. I mean, it's up to you guys. Shall I? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have one more doubt. Yeah, yeah. What's your doubt? Uh, Go ahead. What if, uh, uh, is it safe to use the own signed SSL certificates for your website? Is it good or like bad? No. Always remember, never use uh, self-signed certificates. Get a CA certificate. Okay, nowadays uh, there are a lot of initiatives where you know, uh, a lot of websites and even CA authorities promoting to get yourself an SSL certificate. You can never use self-signed certificates uh, because that might, of course, first thing is any users uh, trying to access your website will get that error, that annoying error that this is not a secure site because the certificate can't be verified and so on and so forth. But apart from that as well, there can be some attacks which can be launched just because your certificate was self-signed. Okay, so always remember to get a proper CA certificate. Uh, so the free certificates are also the not so good for the website? Free because there are so, ma so many free certificates available, right? Yeah, you can get free certificates, but just make sure that they are authorized by CA, root authority. Okay, sir. Thank okay. you. You can get free certificates, that's fine. But just make sure that they are authorized by the root authority. Any more doubts? I'll share some C uh, PPT on CTFs. Just a second. In the in the meantime, I'm sorry. In the meantime, you guys can think of any doubts, any questions relevant to security or okay, not even relevant to security, but you can guys you guys can ask even in the sense of just general career perspective. You guys can ask. Can you guys see the presentation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
okay so this is just a general introduction to cts because you know i i gave this presentation because i feel that ctfs are important if you are getting started into cyber security then ctfs play a major role in that and i'll just tell you why because um okay so i come from a mechanical engineering background okay so i did not have a formal education uh, if you say in it okay or any circuit branch for say but uh, i had participated in ctfs a lot like ctfs uh, for example i gave uh, i had participated for the last year for 50 plus ctfs in just a year okay and that gave me a lot of good exposure to uh, security and uh, com- general computer science as well okay so i highly recommend even if if you are not in it and if you start, want to get started into security then ctfs are really good place to get started and since it's gamified learning so it's not a boring lecture or it's not a boring class or it's not just a boring ppt just like i am giving right now but it's a gamified learning so you'll enjoy learning that because the topics which are covered in that they are in a gamified manner like uh, you need to find something or you know in that sense so that's why first because uh, i've given the this so cyber security is of course information technology domain which focuses on safeguarding data or infrastructures of course so there are three major cat- role categories in cyber security there is red teaming blue teaming and purple team do you guys know about these the teams red team blue team purple team no sir any okay i'll give a general overview then red team basically deals with all the challenges uh, like or let's say that uh, you are working at a product based company okay let's say google okay so google has a lot of products like right they have google drive they have uh, they have uh, slides google docs and so on and so on so what red team will do is red team is responsible for hacking into those and finding out vulnerabilities okay red team basically focuses on offensive security offensive security is where uh, you are the hacker a uh, hacker is of course a very general term but professionally it's known as a penetration tester so red team red teaming involves penetration testing into certain uh, websites or it can be a certain infrastructure or it can be anything but red teaming involves breaking into and finding out vulnerabilities whereas blue teaming involves defensive security here you monitor everything like uh, you keep a, a note on what user is doing what uh, what sites he is he visiting and you know kind of a defensive security where you keep monitors and build defensive tools uh, configure firewalls and so on and so forth so is the difference between red team and blue team clear yes sir yes sir clear yes yeah, so can anyone guess then what purple teaming might be any guesses okay now yeah, my purple teaming is basically a mixture of both red teaming and blue teaming where uh, the purple teaming guys you know they perform red teaming activities as well and they also perform blue teaming activities as well so purple teaming is a mixture of red and blue teaming okay so now hacking what's hacking then 
hacking is a process of finding ways of breaking an application before any criminal does. So as I stated that a hacker is known as penetration tester professionally. So you are a tester, as you can say penetration tester, then that means that's a tester role. But uh, being a tester and being in hacking, it means that you must have a very extensive knowledge about web applications. If you are in web application penetration test or if you are in application penetration testing, then you must have a very good understanding of how applications work, how the system works. OK, so there are two types of hacking, which is software hacking and hardware hacking. Quite simple, right? There's another as well that's cloud infrastructure and so on, but they are irrelevant to us right now. So how CTF or capture the flag challenges comes into the picture. So CTF challenges are hacking challenges or games which help you build the logic and required skill. We'll focus on Jeopardy style. Jeopardy style is basically where you know uh, you are given with the task. You need to complete the task and need to give an answer or in common terms it's known as flag. So here are some categories which are generally uh, generally these categories can be found in any CTF that you play. First is web ex exploitation where uh, you have given some websites or web URLs and you need to exploit certain vulnerabilities present in them that you need to find and get to the answer and give the answer back which is a flag, get to the flag basically. So then there's reverse engineering. Reverse engineering challenges are those where you know you are given an application, okay? And you need to find out what's its logic and then compute the flag. Like uh, you, you, you are given with a compiled binary like .exe or .elf binary. What would you do? You don't have the source code. OK, so you need to find your flag within that binary or from that binary. OK, so that's reverse engineering. Forensics is uh, one interesting because in forensics, you need to perform forensics activities. Now, what are forensic activities? Forensic activities are like, uh, you know, some incident or something has happened. And you need to find out what. So for that, you need to have some investigative mindset. And for forensics category, you might be given a PCAP file. PCAP file is basically a network capture. Like uh, they might say that, OK, so we know that uh, this computer was used by some hacker. Find out what websites did he hack from the network traffic. You have the logs for network traffic So find out from that or you might be given some uh, memory dumps. Memory dumps is basically uh, a, a snapshot or software snapshot of the whole computer, which was, you know, destroyed probably, or, you know, which was attacked. So you need to perform forensics on that, or it might be some image, image forensics as well. Like you have given, you have been given an image and probably you need to find out something which is present in the image. Then there's OSINT. OSINT stands for Open Source Intelligence. Open Source Intelligence is a quite interesting one because uh, it's it's in the real world. OK, it's like uh, you have given, um, for example, you have been given an image of a building. Okay, And you need to find out what's the name of the building. So it, the building might be, you know, it might be in US or it might be in Germany or it might be in, you know, who knows. So you need to find out where that building is or what's the name of that building just by an image. That requires extensive knowledge, like you need to search for that image or you need to search uh, for similar kind of buildings or in, you need to check out some uh, some banners or some 
some some things or some hints which are present in the image. So that's open source intelligence. Then there's cryptography. Cryptography is uh, is uh, is basically a domain where uh, okay you you guys might know cryptography right? You guys know? Yes. Sir. So since you guys know about cryptography, so cryptography challenges might include uh, breaking some ciphers, or uh, or some some text is encrypted and you need to decrypt it. Something is given to you and you need to decrypt that or convert into some information that is known as cryptography. Then PWN challenges are. You know, nowadays they are getting a lot more famous, which is uh, you have been given with a server application. OK, you are not given with something which is on your system or locally. You have been given with a server application which runs on the server. You have been given, of course, uh, some website link or an IP address to connect to it. So you need to exploit the challenge on the server. Uh, and take on the server completely like by exploiting that application you need to you know uh, get a hold of the server and probably exfiltrate some data or uh, you need to read some sensitive files of which are present on the server the example which i showed you for the python it's uh, it comes a little bit under pwn category so that's one thing So for web, as I said, the web category is mostly used by bug bounty hunters. So the most common vulnerabilities that you should be aware about if you are, you know, getting started with web is, of course, as I said, top 10 OS top 10. But just to name a few, then SQL injection, as we discussed, there's LFI or directory traversal, local file inclusion, RCEs is remote uh, remote code execution then there is file upload and there are so many but these are some that you must know that for reversing for reverse engineering see uh, that's what at least i feel okay the application binary is given and it's very straightforward to to address reversing because you know that the flag is present in the binary you have the binary and somehow you need to extract that. OK, so for that you might need skills like, you know, understanding code, understanding how applications are executed, a little bit of operating system knowledge. You know, little bit of that. Everything is fine. For forensics, OK, forensics is more of a blue team role. So as I said, it needs to have an someone needs who is addressing forensics needs to have investigative path or, you know, uh, rather than an offensive path. So typical examples for forensics challenges are stenography. Do you guys know what stenography is? Have you heard the term stenography? Yes, sir. So can you just briefly you know uh, it is like hiding the information in the images yeah absolutely technography is hiding information into images so there are different kinds of technography as well there's a simple hiding of plain text data there's lsb technography lsb stands for uh, least significant bit so there's a lot more technography then there are file magic headers. OK, do you guys know what magic headers are? No. Any idea? OK, so magic headers are basically uh, mandatory headers which are used to identify the file type. Like how will you identify or have you guys ever thought that how does computer recognizes that whether it's a exe file, PDF file, JPG file or PNG file. How can a computer recognize that? 
any guesses any you know a very simple guess from you guys uh i guess in the code the starting letters are uh, representing the file type exactly those are known as magic headers those starting few letters are known as magic headers and to make it more simple and to make it uh, readable for uh, for humans as well uh, we add extensions like exe files will have dot exe extensions jpg will have dot jpeg or jpg png will have png right so that's file magic headers manipulation and something then there's file system analysis network capture analysis memory dump analysis and of course malware analysis malware analysis is personally my favorite one i do it all the time i like to interact with the uh, malwares and you know uh, get to know their logic or what's happening beneath them so does any one of you guys love malware analysis or you know are intrigued by malware analysis anyone no one no one's interested in malware analysis okay never mind uh, not interested not like that but uh, this is our new terms for us so we don't know much exactly about that okay okay no but just in general terms like you you guys know what malware is right malwares are you guys know worms trojans viruses right uh, yeah. yes sir yeah they all are malware right you guys might have heard that never click on a link never download something okay never uh, like execute something which is suspicious on your computer right those are all malware so analysis of those malware is a domain of malware analysis okay so as i said osint you need to search information on available on internet like you can search on twitter linkedin or anything that's open source in general a uh, most common or general term uh, known as stalking uh, you you guys might have heard that stalking term it it comes from osint okay open source intelligence okay stalking is just a simple term and stalking on steroids is osint Okay, you need to completely investigate something like completely investigate a person or completely investigate a company that all comes under osint okay cryptography i as i said if okay if anyone is interested in cryptography then one thing i would say is uh, you need to understand cryptographic algorithms and must have a little bit of mathematical knowledge like you know to reverse cryptography it's really difficult if you don't know mathematics behind that so that's why i would say a little bit of cryptography uh, sorry a little bit of mathematics is good for cryptography so do you guys are you guys aware about concepts like uh, hashing encryption you guys know that Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, which one is uh, reversible, encryption or hashing? Encryption. Right. Encryption is reversible. Hashing is not. So, there might be a lot of challenges from uh, simple encryption algorithms and simple hashing algorithm. So, you guys can look into that. ew in challenges i said they are advanced reverse engineering challenges and uh, the 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 program is run on to the server so you need to gain access control over the server from uh, from that itself so pn is uh, currently very new so you guys can you know uh, pass this one 
because it requires some advanced knowledge but yeah once you have a good grip over some basic categories that i had mentioned earlier then after that you can go for pwn challenges as well so why cpf ctf challenges help you gain foundation knowledge required to get into cyber security and since it's gamified then it's fun right who doesn't love games right you guys play games you guys love playing games uh yes sir like so that's why you know gamified learning is really great it will get help you get foundational knowledge and of course ctf challenges helps you to develop some essential soft skills like research critical thinking patience and curiosity these are one of the most major uh, soft soft skills that that will be polished if you play ctf challenges and finally ctf also provides good career opportunities so this is one this actually true uh, my personal story i would say you know, that uh, no college placements or no off campus interviews have helped me but only ctfs have helped me get into a good company like for example if i got into kpmg just by hiring ctf okay so ctfs are really good for your career as well recently i also uh, was in top 10 for tcs hack quest TCS Hack Quest is again national level CTF. I was uh, ranked seven all over India, so I was called for interview as well. So you know, CTFs have personally provided me with a lot of good career opportunities as well. So that's why I recommend you guys as well uh, start playing CTFs if you guys are in your first year, second year. That's a great time to you know explore a lot of things. So. why not try ctf uh here are some tools list if you guys want i will share the list of tools which are uh, which i personally use while playing ctfs so yeah i mean that's it i do have some other resources like uh, some youtube channels to learn about cyber security or some learning sorry some learning websites like Pico CTF, try at me, etc., etc. So, guys, any doubt? Anything? Any doubts on CTFs, on career opportunities, or in just simple terms of cyber security? Anything? if you guys don't want to unmute then yeah you can uh, drop a question on chat as well come on guys you don't have any questions anything Okay, never mind. If you, I mean, if you guys want, uh, you can contact me any time in future. I, I know you guys might not uh, have any doubts right now. Probably you might get any doubts in some time in future. Then you guys can uh, contact me on my LinkedIn. I'll drop my LinkedIn account. You guys can connect me, connect with me. Oh, I see some uh, questions. Okay, is that built-in function HTML or safe to use? Oh uh, yeah, so, uh, Shambhaji Nimit, 
uh, I did uh, say that, uh, yeah, it's a good level of protection, but the best level of protection for that is to use prepared statements. Of course, that can reduce the attack surface for injections, but uh, you know, there might be certain cases, you know, even I don't know, like any new exploit can come up and you know, any hacker can exploit that. So it's better to have good security controls in place. OK, so what's the next one? Combination of red and blue. Yeah, so, so as I said that combination of red and blue teaming is known as purple teaming. So purple teaming is when, you know, uh, you do both. Like you also do offensive security. You try to break things, try to, you know, hack into system and also do some blue teaming stuff. Like, of course, you have got, you have hacked into system. Now you try to find out that how to secure that or how to configure firewalls, how to, you know, configure EDRs, EDRs is endpoint detections. So, yeah, purple teaming is mixture of red and blue teaming. Any more questions? Anything? Oh, so I want to like just start about the cyber security, but uh, I'm in IT and I have the windows on my PC. Uh, I want to use Linux and I want to learn the Linux, but uh, mm -hmm. I I feel ki uh, ye Linux directly abhi in uh, PC me download karna is uh, not safe for me. Ki agar Windows nahi mila wapas to. Uh, so what mm -hmm. uh, other options I have because the virtual machine is not uh, that fast to uh, give me the experience of Linux. So any other option we have? Okay, so even straightforward. I say two things. Okay, there are two things. Ki, uh, one, you can implement WSL. Agar apko pata hoga ki WSL kya hai. WSL stands from Windows Subsystem for Linux. Okay, you can try googling that. You can get that. Usse Aapko ek Linux based terminal banta hai, hai, where you can, you know, a separate OS hi ho jata hai, samaj lijiye, but which is on Windows and it's a lot faster because I personally use WSL 2 version 2. Usme you can install Kali, usme you can install Ubuntu. So up WSL 2 use kasakta. It's just that ki usme aapko, uh, GUI nahi milega. You'll only get terminal. Hai? And Okay, I would say ki I had started with terminal. So I would say ki aap bhi terminal se start ki chai. Terminal se uske jo Linux commands hote hai, wo aap zyada, jitna zyada use karoge, to aapke, you know, haato pe practice bana it, it, it will be on your fingertips. Aisa hum bolte hai na, ki kuch bhi command likh rahe tha. So aap WSL2 use kar sakte ho. Agar WSL2 nahi use kar sakte ho aap, so, you have two options. If you have a GUI, you GUI. Chahiye to. GUI ke liye, of course, aapne bataya ki you can implement uh, VirtualBox or VMware. Okay, now here's this thing. If you use VirtualBox or VMware, you can download direct IOS file and load it. What do you think? You can use slow. Obviously, we have seen that it is very slow. Chalta hai. So, what do you do? That in websites, you can use specialized virtualized images. Milte. If specially images for, uh, let's say, Kali Linux or yeah, for VirtualBox. Kali Linux image for VirtualBox. Or yeah, Ubuntu image for VMware. Unke jo specialized images milte na, wo download and load it. But on the official website, it is very fast and optimized. So, you can use it. So, you can use it. And dual booting is a final option. Hota hai. Even I won't suggest that you have dual boot karo system. So I would suggest that these two options are WSL is the fastest one, but you don't get GUI, you will get only a terminal. Milega. And terminal is good to you know, uh, get started. Terminal is a good exposure. Aapko. So WSL too, you can use it, but if you need GUI, you don't have to be comfortable initially, 
टर्मिनल पे तो आप वो स्पेशलाइज्ड इमेजेस यूज कर सकते हो तो इज दैट क्लियर या कुछ और डाउट है यस सर क्लियर जस्ट वन लास्ट थिंग दैट डब्ल्यू एस एल मेरे पास अभी वो टर्मिनल है डब्ल्यू एस एल का आई यूज आई हैव डाउनलोडेड बोथ काली एंड यूबन टू बट इज दैट टोटली सेफ कि उससे हम लोग का नॉर्मल विंडोज में कुछ ये नहीं होगा ना लाइक like, इशूज नहीं होगा ना अगर अगर मैंने कुछ गलती से वहाँ पे परमिशन चेंज किया या फिर कुछ किया तो फिर वो विंडोज पे रिफ्लेक्ट नहीं होगा राइट right? नहीं उससे मेरा लॉग इन ही नहीं हो रहा था सो आई एम बिट स्ड की अगर उबन टू ले रहा हूँ एंड आई डोंट नो वट टू डू एंड अगर उससे मेरा पीसी में कुछ डिफेक्ट आया तो फिर आई डोंट नो हाउ टू फिक्स इट एंड उसमें तो फिर ऑनलाइन ट्यूटोरियल्स भी वर्क नहीं करेंगे ओके ओके नो इश्यूज वैसे ये जो डब्ल्यू एस एल भी रन करता है वो एक वर्चुअलाइज थ्रेड पे रन करता है उसके ऊपर जो इवन ऑन विंडोज वो एक वर्चुअलाइज प्रोसेस पे रन करता है सो so, आपको कोई इशू नहीं आएगा उस पर अगर आप कुछ इशू आ भी जाता है तो वो सिर्फ उबन टू तक रहेगा वो आपके होस्ट ओ एस विच इज विंडोज उसके ऊपर नहीं आ पाएगा वो जो भी इशू रहेगा वो तो आप डब्ल्यू एस एल यूज कर सकते हो ओके एनी मोर क्वेश्चन एक आई कैन सी ऑन द चैट इज गूगल क्लाउड कंसोल गुड टू यूज फॉर लिनक्स जस्ट टू स्टार्ट दिट या आप क्लाउड भी यूज कर सकते हो क्लाउड पे भी यू गाइज हैव फ्री टीयर्स सो उस पर यू गाइज कैन यूज लिनक्स लिनक्स बेस्ड ओ एस कोई भी आप उसमें काली इमेजेस भी मिलेंगे आपको ओबन टू भी मिलेगा कुछ भी आप यूज कर सकते हो ऐसा कुछ इशू नहीं है इट्स जस्ट दैट पर्सनली आई फील मेरे पास प्रॉबली शायद थोड़ा स्लो इंटरनेट है सो थोड़ा डिले होता है कुछ भी चीज़ें रिफ्लेक्ट होने में सो पर्सनली आई डोंट प्रिफर ऑन क्लाउड बट आप हाँ क्लाउड पर भी यूज कर सकते हो बट हाँ याद रखना कि वेन एवर यू स्पॉन एन एनी ई सी टू इंस्टेंट जैसे अगर ए डब्ल्यू एस की बात करें आप कोई भी वी एम आप स्पॉन करते हो गूगल क्लाउड पर तो ऑलवेज रिमेंबर कि वो फ्री टायर में हो बिकॉज मतलब अगर आप अफोर्ड कर सकते हो उसका चार्जेस तो इट्स वेरी गुड वेरी फाइन बट फॉर जस्ट टू गेट स्टार्ट वो फ्री टायर में हो एंड उसको जब भी काम हो जाए तो बंद करना याद रखना बिकॉज देर हैव बीन केसेस वैसे कि जस्ट वो ऑन रहता है ना इट कीप्स अब बिलिंग द साइकिल मतलब बिलिंग साइकिल चलते रहता है उसका सो so, बाद में इट कैन यू नो पाइल अप ऑन योर मनी सो वो याद रखिए आप गोल क्लाउड भी यूज कर सकते हैं ऐसा कोई इशू नहीं है और कोई एनी मोर क्वेश्चन एनी थिंग लाइक आयु का इज मतलब ऐसे थोड़ा इंटरेस्टेड की करियर अपॉर्चुनिटीज लाइक दो आपको कोई ऐसा डाउट्स नहीं है कि करियर अपॉर्चुनिटीज क्या क्या हो सकती है कैसे मतलब लैंड किया जा सकता है कोई जॉब वगैरह नथिंग लाइक दैट या बहुत जल्दी है यहाँ आपके लिए आप लोग फर्स्ट ईयर सेकेंड ईयर में हो क्या यस यस ओके क्यों बात नहीं फर्स्ट आई फील फर्स्ट एंड सेकेंड ईयर आपको अलग अलग डोमेन एक्सप्लोर करने के लिए एक्सप्लोर कीजिए सारे एक्सप्लोर कीजिए डोमेन मशीन लर्निंग हो गया डेटा एनालिटिक्स हो गया साइबर सिक्योरिटी हो गया ओ हो गया करिए आप एक्सप्लोर कीजिए थर्ड ईयर से आई वुड से कि थर्ड ईयर से आप एक फील्ड ले लीजिए स्पेसिफिक फील्ड कि आपको हाँ कि डेटा एनालिटिक्स में जाना है या हाँ आपको साइबर सिक्योरिटी में जाना है तो वो फिक्स कर लीजिए एंड देन स्टार्ट वर्किंग ऑन दैट सो इवन इन फ्यूचर अगर आप ऐसा जरूरी नहीं है कि सेकेंड ईयर में आप डिसाइड नहीं कर सकते ऑफकोर्स कर सकते हो 
फर्स्ट ईयर सेकेंड ईयर से अगर आप डेडिकेटेड हो कि आपको यही फील्ड में जाना है वो भी आप कर सकते हो तो अगर आपको कभी कोई भी ऐसे आगे हो कि अगर आप आगे डिसाइड करते हो कि आपको सिक्योरिटी में जाना है तो यू कैन कॉन्टैक्ट मी गाइज आपको मैं हेल्प कर सकता हूँ मैंने मेरा लिंकडिन भी ड्रॉप किया हुआ है यू गाइज कैन कनेक्ट मी विद कनेक्ट विद मी ऑन लिंकडिन आप मैसेज uh, सेंड कर सकते हो उसके ऊपर डायरेक्ट मैसेज एंड वी गाइज कैन टॉक एनी मोर क्वेश्चन कुछ कुछ भी डाउट Sir, I think we are done with the questions. Okay, if we are done, then uh, okay, let's wrap up then. Um, sure, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your valuable insights. Now, I would like to present the moment of appreciation. Please accept it, sir. Okay. Ah, uh, even I am very really thankful for Shah and Anchor Kachchi Engineering College, uh, for giving me this. a uh, stage you know to talk and interact with uh, students and everyone thank you so much for inviting me and you know having a talk thank you everyone thank you team thank you all the organizing committee and i know what what it takes to you know conduct an event thank you everyone and thank you attendees as well for patiently listening to me Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Just one thing, uh, one my uh, sincere request to all of you: just fill fill out the feedback, and do share the results with me as well. Uh, do mention anything that like any feedback. If you liked it, if you didn't like it, and then why didn't you like it, or why did you like it specifically? So yeah, please do share the feedback. guys once you have filled the feedback form you can leave the meeting thank you um okay so i'll leave right now thank you everyone okay if uh, thank you, sir. Thank you sir. if anyone faces any problems you guys can contact me in time thank you sir okay bye bye thank you sir